So I'm speaking with the fantastic Brian Tyler, who has had a very busy summer scoring three summer tent poles. Uh, this summer, Brian scored the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, the disaster epic Into the Storm, and The Expendables 3. He's also up for an Emmy this year with his main title, themed to the hit series Sleepy Hollow, which he co-composed with Robert Littaker. And coming up next year for Brian, we're two highly anticipated sequels, Fast and the Furious 7 and Avengers Age of Ultron. Brian, thanks so much for uh, chatting again. Sure. My pleasure. Uh, so let's start with uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is uh, your fourth feature with director Jonathan uh, Leavesman, who has who does. Uh, how does working with a friend and collaborator kind of help your process? Um, do you find it more liberating with creative freedom, or do you find it kind of harder to impress him because you know you guys have been through so much already, and he kind of knows like you both. in and out? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's um, uh, you know one of those things where you you get kind of a shorthand Mm -hmm. where you musically know where each other are coming from which which can actually it's you want to really do well by whoever you're working with but at the same time it raises the bar uh, because you want to do something that's new and will just basically it becomes a really nice way to have those uh, that that kind of competitive feeling of okay I want to someone I work with a lot, I really want to impress them this time. So, <laughs> um, you, you know, that, that's, that's definitely part of it. And uh, so, so, I mean, the, you know, the film, which had, oh my God, like a huge opening, congratulations on that, and you guys have the sequel underway, um, but since the Turtles have such a long kind of built-in history in pop culture, and I mean, did any of their past incarnations play into how Jonathan approached this incarnation and how maybe you approached the score? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you know. Look, if you if you step back from from something like Ninja Turtles, um, you know the challenge from the very beginning was, okay, well we got this, we we've, we've got this uh, kind of franchise reboot where there's there's been there's like baggage, you mm-hmm. know, in terms mm-hmm. of there was other movies, but at the same time, it's something that it's a beloved franchise from comics and. And uh, we had come from working on very different projects than this, with Battle L.A. and The Killing Room and movies like that. And, right. and so with this, we felt we were kind of... There were, we felt the weight of the responsibility of rebranding something that was... So, like, you know, that so many people grew up with. Uh, and in that way, we couldn't help but think of what we really loved in terms of films as kids and... You know, it's kind of like you watch TV shows, and they're one thing, and you watch films, and it's a, it's another it's another thing. And and sometimes, you know, like the teenage man, you know, like mm, the the, the yeah. tune from it that that works great in the in the show as kind of a theme song. And then you say, okay, what happens when when music hits the live action big screen? And so we immediately thought of things like Raiders of the Lost Ark was was one of them, uh, and how that that worked and, and Superman and movies like that. And, um, and so we thought, well, you know, maybe we should go back, you know, go for a real throwback score, uh, that, that isn't, um, as much as so much like, you know, uh, it's, it's more the, the John Williams style of thematic writing as opposed to kind of the, the really cool, uh, um, more sustained, uh, kind of atmospheric, you right. know, of things yeah, of like yeah. Dark Knight and, and whatnot. Um, and, and the reason we thought that way is because whereas the, the stuff, that kind of thing works so great in the Dark Knight and Man of Steel because it is a more dystopian kind of vision of uh, and realization of those, those kind of comics and um, those storylines, whereas, whereas this was much more kind of the swashbuckling adventure and and i mean it's almost like third generation in a sense of this style of music because really you know uh it comes from the you know the old days with uh robin hood and you know oh, with, yeah, yeah. you know the errol flynn movies and all that and you, you had this kind of really swashbuckling kind of thing which john williams brought back after it was out of style in the 60s he brought it back in the 70s and with star wars and then it'd be you know superman and and uh, Raiders and and all that. And then I feel like now it's kind of a, I think there's a resurgence of that again now. 
and something that I truly believe in. Oh, which you and, know, in your scores, I can definitely tell. It's I mean, with Iron Man three, and you know, it, it, yeah, you definitely exactly. It, it's it's not you know, it's it's orchestral music, and it's not shy about it. And I, I think, uh, and there's a place for. I think we're just in a much wider market now, where there's you can have really interesting, small, quiet, you know, ambient, atmospheric scores. You can have dark scores. You can have, you know, and then I think there's a real place for this kind of thing. Um, in live action movies, you did hear some of that in, in recent years, more with you know some of the animated films. But 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 it's it's with with what I'm doing with the the Marvel films and and uh, which which is a different style of it, but still kind of philosophically in the in the same realm. I think is what you hopefully can get in, in Ninja Turtles, and you just make sure you write the themes very differently, and um, and and that that's with you really at the end of the day you want it to match whatever's on screen right. uh, the best, and 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 that was the approach with Jonathan, and um, and uh, this is the approach to, we really were of like minds when it comes to it, and and you know not everyone agrees, so there there are people that think it should be something else or this or that, and you go through that those trials and. It, we we came out, I think, with uh, something that we're we're really proud of. Oh, well, I mean, it was I enjoyed it so much, and it was because I think it was kind of against expectations, and it did remind yeah. me of those. Uh, and in a good way, it reminded me kind of Jerry Goldsmith's The Mummy, and kind of like a this kind right. of, yeah, this, yeah, swashbuckling adventure film. And it was yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. They, there's there's a bit of that kind of uh, yeah. There's definitely a, a Jerry kind of you know I'm hugely influenced by Jerry and John, and 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 I there there was. You know the the scores throughout the '80s and the '90s too uh, had some of that. It started to drop off a little bit, but you know you remember scores like Back to the Future and, right, and yeah. you know with this with fanfare kind of brass leading these you know big melodies and uh, stylistically and orchestrationally it was something that I felt would I don't know just evoke how I felt when I saw those movies when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, and uh, hopefully it's just being passed on to this new generation. And, oh, and it was, and it definitely did all that. It was great. And uh, mm -hmm. a, another film you did, uh, which is kind of completely different approach, was Into the Storm. And right. I, and I read a quote that you said you approached it as kind of a conceptual score. So I mean, when, yeah. you, when you say that, are you still kind of writing to the picture and context, or are you kind of creating this idea, which you talked about, kind of like a hunter and a, a prey and kind of the savanna? And are you kind of more surrounding the idea of what the... Yeah, yeah. That score, true to being a concept score, which I've done a few, uh, Break and the Killing Room and, uh, you know, The Hunted uh, way back. Um, this one had its own thing. And I think with all concept scores, you, you, you start off with the music. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I waited to see the footage in order to kind of get uh, my best crack at what it would, what it could, what it could be, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I just kind of sat down with it and thought, okay, you know, approaching storm and what it would feel like if you're out there sitting in your car on a one, you know, lane long road that didn't have any turns and you see this, you know, you kind of hear the wispy wind real quietly and, think, hmm, and you're a storm chaser, so you kind of have a sense of it. It's almost like you sense the same feeling as like a, you know, someone maybe that's a hunter, but is being actually being stalked by, the, the, the hunter becomes the huntee, you know, you're being stalked by a lion or a tiger or something. And I just thought that was a really cool idea of um, that premonition and that, that gut instinct that we have. Um, and so it went from there, and I wrote a ton of music before I even saw any footage whatsoever. Um, the entire theme, and that, the, in fact, it's the, the first cue on the on the. Uh, it starts the movie partially, and then it's broken up. But the this, the, the, the end of the storm piece at the beginning of the soundtrack was written before I'd seen a frame of footage, oh, wow. and it was all just Steve kind of describing what what the vibe was when you sit there and he, he was relaying him researching all these storm chasers. And so it was kind of, you know, he's telling you the story and it felt like a campfire tale, you know? So mm -hmm. I was really <laughs> scoring like a campfire tale and, 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 and instead of being kind of music that would necessarily evoke, uh, middle America, um, 
in, in kind of where, you know, in the, in the flatlands where all these storms kind of happen. It was, it, I wanted it to feel like you were, yeah, you were in the savannah being stalked. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I know that some composers do that, and I actually really love that idea of music kind of coming first and then kind of molding the film and then kind of tweaking a little bit. But and when you're working with something like a concept or that idea, um, right. is there ever a fear that maybe the music would service your concept more so than what's happening on screen? Oh, sure, yeah. No, I, uh, there's, there's been plenty of times where I've gone for trying to do something and going with the concept, and then I see the picture, and the music is completely terrible to picture, so I mm. dump it, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, but in this case, it, you know, Steve was so vivid with his stories, you know, uh, that that when I saw it, it was as if I, you know, it, not only did it fit, but it kind of had its own sort of... Uh, kind of uh, soulful mm -hmm. uh, vibe to it, especially in that second half of the movie um, where, where things really get cooking and, 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 uh, and, 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 our, and our team gets in the heart of the storm. So um, it could definitely cut both ways, you know. Can't win all of them. And in that case, you know, I just, I, I have learned to be able to let go and scrap things that I've worked on. It's something that it becomes, uh, it's always painful, but it's something that I, I'm pretty hard on myself. So there's a lot of things that end up in the crumpled, uh, crumpled paper in the trash can. Well, that's pretty interesting. Um, and now your third huge film this summer um, is He's Returning to the Expendables franchise for the third film. Um, right. So has the music kind of evolved over these three films? Was there anything in this film that kind of helped form your score differently than maybe how you would have approached the last two kind of action extravaganzas? Well, it's kind of a new, it's kind of a yes and no. Um, so I really wanted continuity. Mm -hmm. It was important to him. He felt that if you look at his Rocky films and the scores, for instance, they have a certain, I mean, there's actually like sometimes they want to use actually, you know, very, very similar or the same cues for certain things to, to make it feel like you can sit down and watch all three movies and, have continuity. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, of course, always new characters and there's new situations, so you want to up the ante with themes you've already written, but also write new themes, like for Galgo and for Stone Banks, and, and try to mix it up, like St Stone Banks is the villain, and his theme is actually the piano and string concerto. So, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's... It, you, and then Galgo has this real uh, Spanish flavor, and he... There's a real sad, melancholy side to him as well. So, you know, um, it, it's, it, there is new, and, and, and by design, and there is the old as well. Absolutely. And also like with action music and you know, action films, I feel like they're a lot of fun to write for composers because you can be melodic and thematic. But I also feel like it can be kind of maybe hard to say something new musically. I mean, you've scored so many gunfights and car chases and explosions in your career. So when you find yourself with that kind of action sequence to score... What are you? What are you looking for to kind of help you draw something new? Is it? Are you looking at the editing? Are you looking at the, you know, the kind of orchestration of the how the action is? You, you know, there, there's a couple of kind of uh, techniques that I've developed for myself that that keep it, it going. I think in the in the, the the right direction in terms of being able to kind of come up with the the stuff that that not only makes sense but can be fresh is. One, I, I, I usually treat action sequences that are of significant length, uh, major action sequences, as three-act mini-movies within the movie. Oh, okay. And um, instead of just going full bore and, you know, I mean, that's what just becomes tiring is you just hammer away. I can't mm -hmm. do that. just cannot. Um, so you really treat it like it's its own three-act story unto itself. The other thing I think is important is to to me is I really am a believer in instead of going just frenetic sixteenth notes and you know hammering away with stuff I, I I believe melody is hugely important in an action mm -hmm. sequence because it can glide over a lot of the staccato percussion of the the bullets and the car crashes and the you know and all that kind of thing so to me um having something that kind of, like, I, I've found even as kind of a test, 
you know, if you've if you've written a theme that's hopefully good, uh, and it plays earlier in the movie, then uh, and it kind of gets subconsciously lodged in in the viewer's noggin, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of back there. I, I've actually tried things where I'll start playing the theme in action sequence, and something really loud happens for you know, maybe four seconds or something like that. And and my suggestion is, why don't we try this? Let's try stopping the music all the... Cut the music. So we, we're, just not, we're not collaborating. Just cut it for those seconds when it's happening. And, and, the, and the, um, the protest is usually, well, wait, no, that's right in the middle of the melody of the theme. You can't do that. Right. And, 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 and let's say it's for a few seconds, you know. And I say, yeah, you're right. Okay, well, let's try it. You know, with them both blaring. Okay, so then, I actually tried it where it's it's a bit of a mean trick, but I'll play it and then I'll actually mute the music for a few seconds while the big explosion is going. But the theme has already started, maybe two or three seconds before the big explosions and all that. And then when the explosions simmer down, I kind of bring the volume back up on the music and. And, and I kind of say, well, what, what do you think was going on there? And they're like, well, you know, the theme played all the way through there. I like it that way. Well, no, it was just playing in their brain. You know, the, 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 the music wasn't playing at all. But, but somehow if you, if you write a theme that kind of in your head is hopefully memorable enough, then even when it's not playing, it's playing in the, the, the viewer's head. So, so it's kind of psychoacoustics. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, 101, but, but at the same time, I think these are the things, this is why melody, I think, is so important, and people often think there's music playing even when it's not, and, uh, and uh, that's something I've, I've really tried to hone over the years, uh, a kind of mind trick to, to music. Um, and, and then the kind of a third thing uh, with the action sequences, I really pay attention to the EQ ranges. I actually, I, I take a a scope and and get a graphic picture of the EQ of sound effects as they go through a scene and then I just uh, I've through the years kind of learned what instruments seem to be in what EQ range and and then I will just invert it so it's whatever the sound effects are I will do the inverse uh, as close as I can to what natural instruments will play so they can both play uh, at, at, at volume, and uh, they hopefully won't interfere too much with each other. Oh wow, that is awesome! I mean, that is uh, to hear you talk about that because I mean, just from my perspective as a listener, I know yeah. when I know when I'm listening to to music, and you have a big, huge theme like that, and then the composer uh, will just kind of pick out maybe every other note and kind of give you kind of the skeletal version, and that kind of I don't know that evokes something really yeah. different and new in me when I'm hearing that where, you know, I, I think Giacchino does that a lot in Lost and he, I remember he would kind of fracture his themes like that. That's, that's really, that's yeah. Really yeah. Cool. He definitely does that. So that's a, that's a cool technique as well. It's kind of a, it's kind of a cousin to what yeah, I'm yeah, saying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's a similar vein. Um, but so even though uh, for Expendables 3, Sylvester Stallone only directed the first Expendables, he's kind of, you know, he's continued to write the other ones and remain a big creative force behind it. So what's, sure. so what's the dynamic of working, of the working relationship with like, you know, directors like Simon West and now Patrick Hughes, as well as having Sly as part of the creative vision? Is it kind of a community thing? Or yeah, something? it is. It, 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 it is, um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I think everyone wants is pointing in the same direction. That's that's the type of, you know, people that Fly likes to work with. I think mm-hmm. the people that'll that'll uh, make sure that, that everything is, uh, you know, kind of going uh, uh, in accordance to his original vision. I mean, he's definitely the leader. Right. Um, and... and and uh, and the director brings to the table great skill and 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 uh, some, you know uh, that directorial sensibility to it, um, and it becomes a team, um, uh, much in the same way, you know everyone kind of pulls together as a team on lots of films, on Marvel films, you know, right, yeah. and uh, uh, it's kind of like being in a band, you know. Um, that's cool. <laughs> That's cool to hear. And, and so you, you, it's kind of you know you when you're working on this you're you're servicing a, all of us are servicing the the picture and like no producer director composer or actor is really above the above the project. You really try to pull in the same direction to make 
the best product you can. You know? Right, right. And uh, so before we before we wrap up, I know you're heading into two big films next year, and you're returning to Fast and the Furious franchise with Fast and the Furious Seven, which um, you know it all and it's sad because it'll be the last time we'll see uh, the great Paul Walker on screen. I so, know. So well, yeah. no, though, no, knowing that, will that have an effect on how you're going to approach this film? You know, does it put a sense of responsibility on your shoulders? For sure. I mean, it's his last role. Uh, he's a great guy. I. I uh, uh, I knew him a bit, you know, from working with him on so many movies. Uh, I can't even count them. Yeah. Um, but uh, y- yeah, it, it, you you want to pay tribute to this guy who built this series. I mean, him and you know, there, there's a lot of people, you know, involved Neil Moritz and Justin Lin through the years, and and Rob in the first movie, and of course right. Vin, you know, Jordana, uh, you know, the, the, all, we kind of we've we've all more or less grown up together and and he is such the heart of the series that um you know i think this is the one that really feels like it it just um needs to be done just right um so great care is being taken to try to make it a tribute to the the dude that that made it all uh that made it all sing really yeah yeah and i'm sure it's in great hands i, I mean i can't wait to hear what you, yeah, guys, what, you, what you guys see? What, what, what's going to come out? And you know, next uh, is it in the spring? Springtime? Yeah, it is. It's late spring, right? Right. Or flash early summer it depends on what. But yeah, yeah, I think it's yeah, late spring. And uh, so now, and also for Avengers, I know you can't say much, you know, because it's a Marvel film and it's the biggest sequel to the biggest opening film of all time. But any thoughts on how you're going to tackle right. this thing, following Alan Silvestri and you know the high you know, the expectations? I mean, how? Are yeah, you... I mean, it, you know, these. these uh, <laughs> great respect for for alan uh and and the franchise and all the other you know films that have had all sorts of great scores from many composers um uh, because you're dealing with uh, one of those rare movies that see uh, it lives in a universe where there's other movies that tie into the story i mean it's really unique uh and so Balancing all that, balancing the new characters, and making sure that, that you know the, the drama of the film itself is all serviced with uh, with a you know a, a continuity being kept in mind as well. As, or those are all things that I'm going to be keeping in mind. And you got a really cool bad guy too to to write music for, so that should be fun. He's awesome. <laughs> yeah, there's no question. Um, yeah, it's uh, Ultron is. You know, in the comic too, he just he was always one of my favorites, and <laughs> and certainly like just such a cool, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool character and and a great actor playing him. Oh, absolutely! It's going to be awesome. Uh, <laughs> well, Brian, yeah. uh, it's always such a blast to catch up. You, you know, you've, sure. you've really been on fire lately, and your music is just fantastic. So, looking forward to everything that's coming up. And uh, thanks so much for your time today. Of course, we'll talk soon, man. <laughs> <laughs>